Hello and welcome to PT and Nutrition Education's e-learning platform. Today we will be continuing our preparation for the examination in the principles of exercise and training. And our focus today will be on the component of fitness related to flexibility. So as you can see from the objectives we're going to try and achieve today is to define flexibility and the different types of flexibility that there are, identify methods of training for improving flexibility, and then describing the physiological adaptations that occur through flexibility training. Again, just like all of the lectures that you've experienced so far, there will be work tasks for you to complete, interactive tasks and videos which can aid your understanding and prepare you for the exam. So if we first tackle the objective one and defining flexibility, we can see that this is the ability of a muscle and or joint to move through a full range of motion. If we were looking to achieve full range of motion, it is both the muscle and its ability to elongate, but also the joint and allowing the full range of motion uh, of potential of that joint in order for a particular movement to be achieved. So most people will think about a muscle's ability to stretch in order to be flexible. And whilst of course that is very important to flexibility, it's also the joint's ability uh, to be able to achieve full range of motion uh, in a given movement. And this is really to ensure that the joint and the muscles aren't compromised when we're put into a unfavorable position, ensuring that we have a full range of motion in our joints and in our muscles ensures a reduction in injury prevalence. So naturally now the next question that you might be asking is what type of training can we do in order to improve our flexibility and increase our range of motion? So there are four key types of flexibility training which you can see on the screen here. The first one is static and as the name suggests this really is about doing a stretch when you are standing still. So a static stretch is uh, shown here in this picture uh, where we are doing a quadricep stretch, stood up, uh, and simply just stretching out the quadricep by lifting the leg up towards the glute and then putting some pressure on the quad. So this is static stretching. Now, for the most part, static stretching is prevalent within a cool down. So it is better to be doing static stretching either after an exercise session has taken place or the following day to ensure that range of motion is being kept. Okay, it has been proven that static stretching can reduce muscle force um, before a training uh, session takes place. It is much better to be doing dynamic stretching prior uh, to exercise sessions. So in a dynamic stretch, we're talking about a stretch that's on the move. So whilst physically moving the body, we are simultaneously stretching the muscles. So you can see some examples from the video on the screen where we are moving the body and we're getting a full stretch within a particular limb and therefore stretching those particular muscles in order to increase our flexibility. This is much better if we incorporate dynamic stretching at the beginning of an exercise session. Not only is it preparing the body for action, but it's also can be designed in a, in a way where we're making this sport specific. Okay, you can see that some of the stretches within the videos are very relevant to the uh, types of movements that you will see uh, during certain sports. So dynamic stretching should be incorporated into uh, a warm-up routine. Ballistic stretching is actually a very contentious topic when it comes to improving our range of motion. So it is often um, documented that ballistic stretching is very dangerous and shouldn't be completed unless you're uh, an elite athlete and to a certain extent this is true however ballistic stretch stretching does have its merits so performing a ballistic stretch essentially means that we're doing a stretch with a bounce so this is done at a much higher velocity than static stretching or dynamic stretching we're adding almost a power element to that so this can actually be quite advantageous if we're preparing to do something that's quite explosive where the muscle is going to contract and relax at great speeds so this is essentially going to increase the range of motion through the force which you're putting on that muscle and the load that you're putting on it through that bouncing action. This is essentially going to uh, provide a better preparation for any type of power movements like jumping, bounding, skipping, hopping that you may be doing before, for example, a plyometric session. So 
This may have its merits when it comes to power training and improving that range of motion, especially in the short term prior to any kind of power or ballistic training. The last type of stretch is what's known as a PNF stretch and this stands for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And what we're doing here is we're taking advantage of using a partner who's going to help you uh, to stretch a particular muscle whilst you fight back uh, by contracting a muscle. And what's happening here is that with the muscle being stretched and contracted uh, simultaneously, and if we hold this for five to 10 seconds, when we release that particular tension, then the muscle has then relaxed through neuromuscular facilitation, and therefore you're now able to actually stretch that muscle further than what you were prior to actually having your partner put pressure onto a particular limb. So the three main methods that you should be aware of when it comes to your examination are static stretching, dynamic stretching, and PNF stretching. Of course, these can be used in the warm-ups and the cool-downs, uh, but they carry, of course, their own merits, their own advantages, their own disadvantages. And now that you have the information in order to incorporate them, you should be able to make a better decision based on what your client goals is in order to prepare them for an exercise training session and also to help them recover from this. When it comes to testing flexibility, uh, most people have heard of the sit and reach test where we take our shoes and our socks off, we place ourselves uh, sat down against the box and we put our feet onto the box, our knees straight, and then we simply just reach as far as we can in order to determine the flexibility of our hamstrings and lower back. Again, there are advantages and disadvantages to this in that it's measuring static stretching uh, ability, but also only measuring the um, static flexibility of our hamstrings and lower back. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have full body flexibility when it comes to a good score obtained from this particular test. The other one, and maybe a little bit more specific to the joints, is goniometry. So this is essentially just measuring the angle at which each of the joints is able uh, to express full range of motion. So each uh, joint has a full range of motion which it should be able to achieve, whether that's 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. And you can simply take each one of your limbs through that range of motion to determine how flexible those muscles and those joints are. And lastly, we are talking about the physiological adaptations of flexibility training. As we mentioned in the very first slide, there is a reduced risk of injury. If we're able to take a muscle to a full range of motion, then if it is in a compromised position, there is less chance of that muscle tearing and therefore injury from occurring. And the same applies to a joint. If we're able to take a joint through a full range of motion, once again, if we're in a compromised position during an event, a sport, or even a gym exercise, then the joint has been there before. So it is therefore able to deal with the loads and the positions which you're putting it under. The second adaptation is an increased elasticity of the muscle tissue. Elasticity refers to the muscle's ability to stretch, but then also return back to its original length. If we've got the ability to do that, then there might be some increased potential for force production. We'll talk more about that in the final adaptation. The third one is an increased resting length of muscle tissue. If we have an increased resting length of muscle tissue, then therefore we've got a greater range of motion as a starting point. And once again, that can increase our flexibility and again, reduce our chance of injury. It also maintains joint health. As we mentioned, flexibility is not just about the muscle, but also about the joint. And taking a joint through a full functional range ensures that we try and avoid the acute and chronic issues that are often associated with joints, especially as we age. And if we take the last physiological adaptation there, we can see that that's greater force potential due to increased elasticity. So if we imagine our muscle like an elastic band, if we've got a more ability to stretch, then there's going to be more force potential within that muscle. If we stretch an elastic band a little bit and then let it go, then that's gonna generate a little bit of force. But if we stretch it to its full capacity and then we release that elastic band, it's going to re release a lot of force. So there is at least a potential with increased range of motion within a particular muscle to generate more force. 
So to finish off the area of flexibility in your principles of exercise, fitness and health work booklet, there is a section on flexibility where you're asked to identify the definitions, the types of training, the training protocols and the training adaptations to help you remember some of the key points related to flexibility training.